BF, if you're not familiar, uh, owns 30 different brands in the apparel space, everyone from the North Face to Timberland to Nautica. I represent the Jeanswear Coalition, that's Wrangler and Lee, but I also work on the workwear division, that's all our B2B businesses, a lot of brands that you might have had heard of before, but in the industrial uniform space. And then I also oversee the small geographic regions of uh, Mexico and South America as well. So lots of fun stuff. But uh, if you're not familiar with Wrangler and our brand, uh, we are based in North Carolina. We have been historically, it's a bit part of our ethos. Uh, Wrangler was originally owned by Bluebell, Bluebell Overalls. Um, and before that, it was actually Hudson Overall Company. Uh, it changed its name uh, to Bluebell because of its relationship with train engineers. And actually, if you're not familiar with Greensboro and the, the train line that goes straight through Greensboro, there was a time in history where um, the train engineers used to go into the Hudson Overall factory to buy their overalls, and they developed such a rapport with Mr. Hudson, the owner, that they uh, gifted him a bell from, as you can imagine, the, the engine of the, uh, the train. Now, they hung that bell in the manufacturing floor, and like every good textile factory, this fire uh, particulates started floating in the air and it was blue dust and it gathered and collected on the, uh, on the bell and became blue and then hence they renamed the entire Operation Blue Bell Overalls. Um, gave birth to Wrangler in 1947, we became the rodeo gene of choice. We have strong origins in Western wear um, and you can see some of the, the current brand representation there. You know, I speak romantically about that, that blue hue over the bell because in all reality, that's a very uh, big environmental human health issue in textile manufacturing that we'll revisit in a second. Um, but if you haven't seen our national advertising campaign, uh, I agreed to come as long as I could sell you for 30 seconds. So let's just do this real quick. Get up and breathe the rising sun. Race toward the horizon. Leave the pack or go alone. Take only what matters and leave the rest. With new styles and great fits, Wrangler jeans are ready for anything. The only question is, are you? Wrangler, new styles, great fits. All right, so pretty fun. Lots of, uh, you know, it hits the girl. We got the rodeo heritage, the western. We got uh, vintage Broncos going through the mountains. I mean, unsold. Um, with, <laughs> pop quiz. Uh, does anyone know the first textile mill in the United States? When did it come into, into birth and its origins? Any guesses? How many years after the Declaration of Independence? Five? Fourteen to be exact. 1790, uh, a gentleman named Samuel Slater uh, created a, a textile mill in Rhode Island. Some people claim it was the, the first manufacturing mill, or first manufacturing actual factory in the United States. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of industrial people. I'm not sure what criteria they used to skin that exactly, but even Andrew Jackson referred to Samuel Slater as the father of the American Industrial Revolution. Uh, PBS later called him uh, the first industrial spy, knowing that he came from England as an apprentice with one major cotton mill and brought with him in his own head, in his own knowledge, from memory, he reconstructed a mill in 1790 in Rhode Island. Um, but 25 years later, after 1790, the first textile mill was created here in North Carolina, in Lincoln County, not but 100 miles south, uh, maybe south of Hickory uh, kind of area. Um, and that was created by a gentleman named Michael Schneck, um, and I realize I'm running a risk of, of uh, talking to a, a group of learned folks and going through history and these data points. If you stare at this long enough, it'll start, start spinning and you'll become one, two, three, under my control. No, <laughs> uh, what I want to fast forward, because I know I'm going through the big history lesson here, this, this slide represents 1840. And you can see the, the broad geographic distribution of mill presence by spindles. When Samuel Slater opened his mill in Rhode Island, it was 79 spindles. You can see the, the, the scale there is in thousands of spindles. Um, but just to give a sense that, uh, that we are in the, the sort of the, the hotbed area of textile production, as I'm sure many of you are aware, that there's a long standing history here. And if we had to fast forward from 1840 all the way up to 1923, North Carolina was second to Massachusetts in total spindles and manufacturing production. It was over 350 mills in North Carolina in 1923, uh, 80,000 jobs, and about $350 million in annual um, 
produce goods. So hugely significant. And think about the legacy of this when we rewind to 1790 and think of Samuel Slater coming and inventing that mill and the industrial revolution that was going on in England that later gave rise to corporate accountability and what moral obligation does a company have to protect its workers against fiber inhalation or the smog related to on-site coal usage. Um, those very issues follow us today in our supply chain. Um, Sarah shared a little bit about the TSC and some of the work that they do as a member, as a responding member of the Walmart Sustainability Index and sitting on the Clothing, Footwear, and Textiles Committee with uh, Philip and, and Sarah. Uh, we use this hotspot analysis a lot, and I think Sarah might underplay the value of hotspot analysis, from at least from a business perspective. When I walk in and talk to leadership, brand leaders, and say, what is the most important thing for us to focus in on? Well, I've got 13 of them, 13 most important things. This process of going from uh, a meta-analysis of the literature to arriving at these 13 most critical KPIs to making its way into a business conversation where a Walmart buyer is sitting across the room from a Wrangler representative to talk about next year's collection, and oh look, here comes our sustainability score populate up on the metrics. This is real connectivity that I think a lot of us have longed for for many years, and these tools and these KPIs allow us to do that. And hotspot analysis is simply, what is that biggest impact across that life cycle stage? That's how we would define it. It's so critical the way that we think about how to influence and make change, but where we put our focus and drive our energy. And the reason I teed up some of that historical um, knowledge is that when we look at how are we doing today, a lot of those legacy environmental issues of uh, human worker safety and well-being, uh, from polluting an environment or how well are externalities represented uh, in a global community, we, we haven't done a great job. Or we still have some of those same issues plaguing our industry today. Uh, pop quiz, in Bangladesh today, of the 400 textile mills, what would be the percentage of mills that are doing the right thing with their wastewater, that are actually managing wastewater correctly? Zero. Zero? Five percent? Ten? I think we're going higher. Twenty-five percent is the, is the percentage of mills in Bangladesh that are actually treating their wastewater. I was in Bangladesh with a room full of 80 suppliers, and I asked this question, uh, who here has ever bypassed your wastewater system? Uh, very honest, very naive, uh, very direct, and the, the reaction I got from this room of our suppliers was, was mixed. Some people laugh as if, how would you ask that question because do you think you're actually gonna get the right answer? Um, some people kind of jeered as if, oh my gosh, I've been found out, I'm gonna now hide under my seat, right? The, the, the human interaction by opening up that discussion uh, is really challenging. And then just last week, we've got blue dogs, six blue dogs in Mumbai, uh, India, um, where a dye stuff factory had a, a sort of a failure and it literally ended up in this area where the dogs became painted blue. So not necessarily good uh, representation of our industry. This is a, a footprint that we work to manage across those 13 different issues across the globe. Um, and it's something that uh, working through collaborative working groups with the TSC, that we, there's, there's more power in numbers. Um, but when I came to a brand like Wrangler, as you can, as you can imagine, 1947, uh, Rodeo Gene of Choice, certainly has uh, you know, a brand ethos and a representation. It doesn't necessarily lend itself well to uh, you know, maybe a Prius consumer or a Whole Foods market. If we're talking about selling mass market jeans uh, in big box retail and also into our Western specialty stores. So how are we gonna make sustainability click? How are we gonna make that connect? What is our brand connection? And it began by interviewing the leadership uh, by all of our leaders. And what came out of that was not your traditional language around, we gotta mitigate climate change, we gotta watch our water impacts. But it was this language that, that, that emerged, this personal ownership statement that, hey, we take care of things here. Like, no matter what we're gonna do, we wanna feel like we're taking care of things. And so that became the pillars of our platform. We take care of, we're gonna take care of the land, we're gonna take care of our people, we're gonna take care of our industry, Mumbai and Bangladesh included, and we're gonna take care of the future. And we kind of left that a little bit nebulous to allow for other innovation projects to emerge. Um, but in that, pro in that process of uncovering what are we gonna do, what are, what are the story that we're gonna tell, um, you know, this very pragmatic cost engineering approach to our manufacturing environment, we actually went back 
uh, 14 years of history going through data records about the water consumption in our product. This was the most laborious project, and I don't recommend it, but it, it, it yielded uh, this infographic that we were able to share with consumers about our commitment and our efforts uh, in water recycling. And this is, this is a, a simple process, and the more that I learn about what we did, the more that I, I feel like we gotta write that white paper, we gotta get this out there, that this is so simple to take wastewater from a sequential batch reactor that has the physical, chemical, and mechanical wastewater treatment, get it to the quality that we need, add a disk filter or reverse osmosis onto it, get it to the quality that we need, and then put it back in a rinse cycle for wash down and down. Like those steps right there, that's the meat of what was achieved through this three billion liters of water avoided, saved, left in the ground, recycled through our industrial process over the course of 10 years. This gets me excited, but I feel like it only gets me as excited as we have widespread use of this story as opposed to the story of Bangladesh or Mumbai. A few things we're doing differently today um, for indoor ambient air quality. The denim and all the fun striations and character that you see, this is called whiskering right here, and all of this, this detail that we pride ourselves on. That's done by these operators right here that are working in front of inflatable legs uh, with the denim and they're actually sanding with sandpaper and other abrasive tools to get that visual characterization. This is a technology of the past. Uh, we've done away with the sandpaper and even in the past 18 months, we've been implemented more than six lasers. And I recognize this is kind of a hard image to see, but if you look right here, where in the interface, this dark and light area, and you see this, this is smoke coming from a laser that's emitting and creating that same amount of etching going on. And this is a technology that's become available to our industry um, probably in the last, well, three, three, three years, but has seen widespread adoption over the past 18 months. We bought like six of these in a heartbeat. And usually, business case, you have to go through all the, you know, the rigmarole of proving why you would implement something like this. It was super clear to our folks because of the, the human uh, health criteria. Something else, you know, joining Wrangler and starting this platform about two and a half years ago, something else that, that came top of mind and a connection that we had as a brand uh, was our partnership and our relationship with Future Farmers of America. They don't technically use Future Farmers of America, it's still, it's FFA is, is, is how they refer to themselves because they want to be more than just uh, farm producers, but the, the, the biotech, the support services, all the folks involved with the ag industry We've been supporting that youth organization for 50 years, and it, it, it occurred to me, and listening to all of the, the wisdom and the guidance that's coming out of the NRCS office, Natural Resources Conservation Service of the USDA, the field agency, is working to transform how we think about on-farm practices from a macro environmental chemistry set of NPK to living, breathing, healthy soils. And there's a soil renaissance that's going on since 2011, up until now, with the creation of the Soil Health Institute in Raleigh, but I realized that this conversation, it's, it's happening up here, it's happening in research, it's happening in academia, it's happening in the NRCS, and in many cases on our farms, which is important, but we also wanted to share it with our kids. For us, as a brand, for our product line, roughly 50% of the cotton that is in our product comes from U.S. farmers, U.S. cotton. Line. How can we um, continue to support and promote the, the vitality of cotton growing in the U.S., but also the use of sustainable best practices? So by the time you all are, you know, in my age, there's going to be nine billion people face on the face of the earth. You think about it. These nine billion people, they're going to need something to eat. Consumers are wanting to know where their food comes from. They're wanting to know that what they put on their mouth and on their body is not having a negative impact on the environment. By looking at these healthy soil systems and actually going into production agriculture, it's really about reducing your inputs and your, your environmental impact. Well, as a growing population, and with everyone being concerned about health, and farming practices, I just want to do it the best way possible, the healthiest way possible. I like that what Rambler is doing today, you know, it's not just all about genes and marketing and a business to them. They're really getting down back to the roots of where their where their genes are coming from, where that cotton's coming from. It comes right back down to the farmers. Every prices are down, crop prices are down, and the farmers don't learn how to manage inputs and 
and actually function the way nature was intended, and they're not going to make money. So all those living, breathing things, processing life and has life in it, we rely on that a lot. And so people can be more aware that pretty much everything we do depends on soil in some way. That's, that's step one. If we don't take these practices on and start looking at the soil instead of looking at the next piece of equipment to run across the ground, we're going to have problems. If we can produce more cotton, better cotton, then Wrangler's going to have more products to make. They're going to be able to make better products. Better products that are going to clothe people better, that are going to be more sustainable so that we can continue to conserve our resources, so that we can keep producing things for as long as we all live. So we had 100 students come to the Wrangler headquarters in Greensboro for a Saturday afternoon. We were competing with sporting events, uh, all kinds of award ceremonies, you know, young people trying to get ready for college, that kind of thing. And then the energy that came out of the room, you would think some of those people were pre-scripted or we gave them lines, right? That was the result of a day's worth of training. It was just their enthusiasm and their excitement about participating uh, in a soil healthy, healthy soils platform. Um, and when we think about what that means, uh, and I think a lot of times sustainability and, and, and the metrics and some of the KPIs we use are focused on you know, squeezing more widgets out of the same amount of resources. There's nothing wrong with that, but I think what gets me excited about the, the ability to tell a story around healthy soils is that it's, it's about us feeding the land, not necessarily the land feeding us. It's, it's kind of the inverse relationship, and the number of farmers that are gravitating to these approaches uh, are, are significant. Um, some of them are, are relying upon uh, older, you know, an older sort of way of life or tradition of thinking of, of, of stewardship. And then at the same time, there are some young people who have gotten away from farm that have come back to farm because of things like this. And it's an amazing transformation when they, the certain group of young farmers feel that they can have a, a role and a part in being a part of a bigger solution. Um, so what are we talking about specifically? We're talking about organic production, right? No, well, we're not talking about organic production. Organic in the cotton supply chain up makes up less than 1% of the global supply. It's cost prohibitive for us. It sells at a buck 20 a pound, double. Um, in some cases, uh, organic cotton production uh, still needs to work out some kinks, meaning you can still spray arsenic in organic production uh, because it's a naturally occurring thing. Arsenic, organic, doesn't make sense. Uh, we're focused on an agnostic system. We can use a healthy soils platform in either an organic or a conventional growing system. The focus is the earth. The focus is the land and land management practices. We're talking about crop rotation, and not just any crop rotation, but complex crop rotation. Three different crops in the same area of land over a five-year term. That's complex crop rotation. By changing up the crops, you're not allowing that pest pressure to develop in that soil structure in a way that's going to compromise future yields and profitability. Cover crops in the off season between the harvest by planting uh, beneficial cover crops. Now wheat and rye are the most common, but these multi-species cover crops are coming into play. You're creating an uh, opportunity to drive nitrogen back into the soils, to keep that soil um, aerated and to create you know, little cavities in the soil from the root structure and what have you. Uh, in Tennessee, they're actually using the sweet potatoes North Carolina is like number one in sweet potato production, by the way. But in Tennessee, they're using the turnip and the sweet potato as an off-season crop to create deep crevices and channels to penetrate and allow water infiltration to get into their soils. Conservation tillage, the idea, this romantic vision of the tractor going across the landscape and opening up the earth every season, that is so antiquated. It's ugly farming. Ugly, ugly farming is the new green. Because that stubble, that residue, that leaf, that trash, that is the biomass that we want to see on farm. That's the practice. These are the practices that if we could have the Wrangler cotton growers implementing, um, that we would see in tremendous wins. And when we relate this back to carbon sequestration for each one of these practices, I'm going to just roughly say 300 pounds per acre, additional carbon sequestration in soils. Check. 300 pounds per acre, 300 pounds, and just go through the list. The more that we're able to adopt and cascade these, these types of practices into our production systems from integrated pest management, efficient irrigation methods. The time is now. I was in Lubbock, Texas two weeks ago, and they have subsurface drip irrigation that reduces the water consumption for cotton, Texas by 95%. 95%. It lasts 40 years in the ground. I mean, these tools are available. 
The ag community is going through a dot-com revolution right now as we speak. We have everything from drones being introduced to variable rate application, that soil grid mapping is this idea. Now, we heard earlier about the excess uh, nitrogen fertilization, right? Roughly 30% of excess nitrogen fertilization um, on average. If a farmer can look into that field, that swath of field, and say, I have a deficit here, but I have a surplus here, and they can adjust the rate of applications for things like nitrogen, other fertilizers, um, then we can reduce. We can significantly reduce the impact, and we can also increase the profitability of the farm, and we can mitigate the, um, you know, the surrounding environmental consequences of runoff into our waterways. So when I think broadly about our path and what does it look like for Wrangler to embark on this journey, because we just kicked off this campaign in May, so I'm telling you a lot of the, the background to the story that we're going back and building the framework with, and this idea of no definition around sustainable U.S. cotton, that if you look at the, the, the impacts of cotton, and you, know, you gotta look really closely from organic methods to you know, BCI out of Asia, Better Cotton Initiative out of Asia, compared to U.S. growers here, and the value that mechanism and the mechanization and that even genetic traits have allowed for the reduction of impacts in cotton growing, there's still no clear definition. And I hate it when people say there's no clear definition. We want to define it, and for us, we're defining it as healthy soils. 100 million tons of soil lost through erosion just on cotton fields every, every year. That's something we want to reverse. We want to add soil back. And what would it look like if Wrangler growers would commit to growing, adding 1% of organic matter to their soils every three years? That we keep pushing that threshold of what, what are, our, are the future soils that we want to have represented look like? Uh, addresses water scarcity issues. Texas is the number one uh, cotton producing state, also very prone to, to water scarcity, uh, being on the southern end of the Oglala water basin. Um, this practice holds more moisture in the soils and allows for, for better productivity. It's a resilience against drought and other water scarcity. So in our uh, quest here and in, in, in our nine partners that we've onboarded, we've, we've, we're working with nine different partners, including the TSC, the Soil Health Institute out of Raleigh that I mentioned. Um, we're advocating for some of these precision farming technologies, focus on soil health, and a lot of our peers are generally focused globally, and there's nothing wrong with that. We are focused globally, too, out of, out of our entire cotton supply chain, you might have heard in the video, 50% comes from other geographies. And we rely on the Better Cotton Initiative platform to help us achieve our goals there. But when it comes to the US, how can we support these farming practices? How can we, uh, you know, claim or, or fulfill our commitment to take care of the land and to take care of our industry by doing this and what it will do for farmers' overall productivity. This is the journey that we're on in this process. Um, and very specifically what that means for us is that we've, we've worked with two farmers so far. We've got a whole list of potentials that we want to onboard. Um, the newbies out of Athens, Alabama, not far from Huntsville, uh, just sort of the northern section of Alabama has been a, a great partner relationship, and in many cases they are using more, uh, several of those practices that you saw listed. They're teaching us and helping us pressure test some of our ideas at the same time. Because any program like this, as you can imagine, needs to be not just the high performers, eventually we want to get there where our entire portfolio is represented with these practices, but we also have to train, teach, and mentor one farmer needs to mentor another farmer to get and grow the overall performance of the entire category. That's really important to us. So the newbies, we, we met through uh, our partner, uh, Bear Crop Science and the E3 Growing Platform. Uh, more recently, we've been working with the Burlingtons in New, excuse me, New London. Um, that's the closest uh, cotton farm to the Wrangler headquarters in Greensboro. And we arrived at the, at the Burlingtons through a partnership with uh, Cotton of the Carolinas. Uh, Eric Henry is in the room here today. He, been working on the Cotton of the Carolinas platform for more than 10 years to show this radical transparency between dirt to shirt and fiber to full production here in North Carolina. And then, as I mentioned just in Lubbock last week, meeting with the PCCA and several folks, this entire group of young farmers being onboarded into this farming cooperative. There's a lot of young faces in there and it kind of gets us excited. But I thought I'd actually end with letting the newbies have the, the final word on some of their experiences. Every farm in this county is generally a family farm. Two brothers, daddy, children, uh, 
it's just it's just part of life. You've got to have somebody you can cover for you. You've got to have somebody to help you. There's a certain good pride and feeling about your children wanting to follow you in the profession you have. Cotton, Cotton has always been a part of our family farm, and it probably always will be. I feel like Wrangler coming in and purchasing the cotton from a grower is putting a face with cotton, a farming face where people can see where their fiber comes from. Many people don't understand. Some people have never even seen cotton, you know, growing in the field. And I think it's going to be a great thing for Wrangler and for the American cotton grower to be able to market their product. If we don't tell our story, nobody will, and Wrangler's helping us tell our story of how we farm as a family and how we make a living and we pass it on to the next generation. I got to spend a week with the, with the newbies in Athens. Uh, I enjoyed my time very much. Uh, I learned a lot. And, uh, you know, I think if there was any closing remarks on this, this, this day has felt very synergistic in terms of all the comments and the way that things are coalescing. Um, I think that the, the impression that I had of working with the newbies for that week uh, was just the, the amount of innovation that can happen in, in pockets of our rural communities, right? And the opportunity that we all have to influence global issues like climate change. I have uh, been in rooms and conferences similar to this with uh, ranchers and farmers both. Uh, probably one of the most memorable experiences I had was a, a pre presentation given by Dennis Hancock from University of Georgia on this idea of um, adaptive multi-paddock grazing and the opportunity that we have to, to use our agricultural lands to drive carbon into soils. And the reaction from the room, and now given this was everybody that was interested, they took time out of their day to come to a conference. Uh, at the very end of Dennis Hancock's speech, he shared that if we use adaptable multi-paddock grazing, it's got a couple different names, mob grazing, um, complex rotational, there's a few different varieties, um, and the studies they showed, if we use this practice um, in just 10% of the degraded agricultural lands in the southeastern uh, part of the United States, we could sequester or remove enough carbon to take 3.6 billion cars off the road, billion with a B. Um, and the reaction from the room was ridiculous. It was incredible. I've never experienced or seen anything like this. Everybody stood up at the same time, impromptu, uh, because they were excited. They were excited to be a part of the solution. They were excited that there was something that they could do on farm that actually made a difference. And again, it was the converted, and if you talk to Dr. Alan Franz Lubers, he disagrees with Hancock about the rate of carbon sequestration in the soil, so that's a, a minor point. The point isn't about the technicality of the rate of, of sequestration. The point is that there is an equal opportunity for everyone to participate in the solution generation that's going to be required to solve some of our global issues. So thanks for having me and thanks for having Wrangler.